One. You will hear a student and an advisor talking about facilities at a college. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully, and answer questions one to five. Hi, I wonder if you could help me. I'm starting a course at Glenfield in a few weeks. I was just a bit worried about what facilities there will be, and what I'll have to do. I'm especially interested in health and welfare stuff. Certainly, we normally send out a copy of our leaflet, staying healthy at Glenfield. I'm not sure why you haven't had it. Well, could you answer a few questions for me? Firstly, I'm wondering about how I get a doctor when I arrive. Well, you can register with the University Health Centre on North Campus. And do I have to pay for that? Not to register, but if you have to get medicines, there's a prescription charge of six pounds fifty. Okay. Well, I'm not planning to get ill. That's only going to arise if I have any problems. So, should I just go along when I arrive? That's what we recommend for peace of mind. But it's not compulsory. And if you don't live inside the catchment area, you can't, in fact, register there. Where do you live? Well, at the moment, I'm staying at the Backpackers Hostel in Hill Street. But I will be moving from there shortly, somewhere nearer. Well, there's a map at the centre which shows you the area that the university practice can accept people from. It's what we call the yellow zone. If you live outside that area, you have to find another medical centre to register with. It sounds like I'll only qualify after I move. I think you might be right. Then, in addition to the health centre, there's a free counselling service for all students situated on the north campus. You don't have to register. They also have drop-in sessions. I say it's free, but that's only for up to eight sessions. Beyond that, they normally refer people elsewhere. Sounds serious. Well, it's not just for big problems. People go there for advice on housing, workload, whatever. Really, they can even arrange financial help.、Hmm. Uh, is it confidential? Absolutely. Then again, a lot of students prefer to phone the Nightline service, which is run from an office on the central campus. They don't really encourage people to drop in. I see. So it's basically a free phone line. The number, if you want to make a note, is o nine hundred seven six two five nine one three. I'll say it again: o nine hundred seven six two five nine one three. Fine. Well, I hope I won't need any of these. What I will want is access to some gym facilities. Right. Well, you'll find those on the south campus in the sports centre. It's great, but it's not free. You have to present your student card and pay a fee of twenty-two pounds to get a pass. But that will last you for the whole year. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions six to ten. Now listen and answer questions six to ten. Is this information on the website? I'm afraid not. I can send you some leaflets, or even resend the whole information pack if you give me your details. Uh, could you send the whole information pack, please? Yes, that's fine. I'll have to take down some details. Could you tell me your full name? Sonia Orr. S O. N Y.、Uh, no, I'll spell it. S O N I A. Then, or is O R R. Or, okay. 
And you said you were on Hills Road? Yes, but don't send it there as I'm about to move. I'll give you my new address, which is 22 Winter Gardens. That's Glenfield. And the postcode? Oh, yeah. That's GF23 9BQ. Fine. Now, we're doing a bit of data collection about who uses our services at the moment. Can I just ask a few more questions? Yes, that's fine. OK. If you're an international student, what country are you from? I'm from Switzerland. And how old are you? I'm 24. And finally, which course are you enrolled on? Right. Well, that's a bit complicated, since I'm hoping to switch to economics and history. But at the moment... I'm down to do economics and sociology. It's a joint degree. OK, I'll put that. Great. Well, I'll pop the information pack in the post, and you should get it soon. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Part 2 You will hear part of a local radio program about fighting air pollution in Canadian towns. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 14. Good morning, folks, and welcome to the Information Roundup on your own local radio station. This is Larry Knowles talking to you this morning on Tuesday, the 25th of May. And the first item coming up is a reminder to you all out there about Canadian Clean Air Day, which is on June 6th. In case you weren't around for the last one, this is a chance for Canadians everywhere to focus on the problems of air pollution and to actually try to do something to help reduce the problem. How many Canadians do you think die annually because of air pollution? 2,000? 3,000? Well, the rate is a staggering 5,000, and it's likely to grow, unless we do something. And... It's this concern with your health that's the driving force behind the government campaign that is sponsoring Clean Air Day. So what causes air pollution in the first place? Well, the transportation sector accounts for 27% of all greenhouse gases produced in Canada. It's also the biggest source of that thick, polluted air from traffic fumes that we call smog. And it's the tiny particles and ground-level ozone in smog that are the main causes of health problems and even deaths across the country. Of course, it's worse in the big cities, but researchers have only recently realized that all you need are low levels of air pollution to seriously damage your health, so we're all at risk. You now have some time to look at questions 15 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 15 to 20. So, what can we do to fight air pollution? Well, it should be pretty obvious by now that the way we get to and from work every day can have a big impact on the air we breathe. So the easiest action you can take on Clean Air Day is to accept what we call the commuter challenge. 
and get to work on foot or by cycling for a change. If you have to use your car, try carpooling and share the drive, or better still, use public transit. If everyone tries this for just one day, you'll be amazed by the difference it can make to the air in our towns and cities. But there's more you can do to improve air quality. For example, you can plant trees. And if you don't have a garden, then you can do your bit in other ways. For instance, did you know that modern, improved wood stoves can reduce wood smoke by as much as 80 to 90 percent? So you can make a big difference if you upgrade the appliances you use in your home. The government is also working hard on your behalf to clean up our air. Its priority is to reduce the emissions that cause smog, and they have clear plans to get there. Last year, Canada and the United States agreed to reduce emissions on both sides of the border between the two countries, and they plan to reach their targets in the next few years. The government's also taking action to get cleaner fuels. It's already reduced the sulfur contained in gasoline, and it hopes to reach the reduction target for sulfur and diesel by next year. But the measures don't just focus on the motorist. The federal government's also working to reduce emissions from power plants and factories right across the provinces. You can find out all about government action and all the plans for Clean Air Day events. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Methods course. A girl called Leela and a boy called Jake having a seminar with their tutor. Now you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now listen and answer questions 21 to 24. So the task I gave you both was to choose an article about a small-scale research project. Yes. yes. You were then required to try to reproduce the research procedures in your own context, i.e. try it out for yourselves. Yeah, and that's what we've done. Great. So I'd like you to tell me a bit about the article and why you chose it. Well, the article's written by two university lecturers who had started using crosswords to help their students revise terminology for exams. And the crosswords were designed and set on computers. And we selected the article because, well, it seemed an accessible topic, even though we weren't familiar with the technique. You know, using IT to design crosswords for higher education. That's a good reason. So these lecturers wanted to see how well this innovation was received by their students. Yes. So how did you go about reproducing the research? Well, we drew up a list of terms from one of our own modules and designed a crossword for revising these terms. Then we asked our classmates to try out the crossword and give us feedback, you know, their opinions on how they felt about using the technique. Was it easy to find participants? It wasn't easy at first, but then we convinced them that by taking part in the research, they were actually benefiting themselves by preparing for an exam, which is coming up later this term. And it worked. Good. So how did you find out what the students thought about doing the crosswords? A questionnaire. The original article used a two-page long questionnaire. There were lots of excellent questions on it, but the whole section on difficulties using IT is now obsolete. Old-fashioned, even, even though it had only been written a couple of years ago. So you designed a shorter version? Yeah. Then we sent it to the 40 students by email and got 28 replies. I was taken aback by the fact that everybody we talked to thought this was a good return. 
I mean, the responses were well written, you know, people had taken a lot of care, but I was really disappointed with the low numbers. Yes, an important lesson to learn for an apprentice researcher. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. So what results did you get? Well, basically the responses were extremely positive. The students said that doing the crossword on a computer helped them really focus on the work in hand and not be distracted, which is something that commonly happens with other ways of doing revision. Yeah, that was really clear. But something that struck me was that having fun hardly featured in their responses, nor did anything to do with spelling of hard words, which I thought would be an obvious benefit. No? Okay. Respondents also said that doing the crossword hadn't really increased their general motivation to study, but that it had highlighted the gaps in their memory so they knew what further work was necessary. Right. So how did your findings tally with those of the original researchers? There were lots of similarities, but... Uh... There were probably two main differences. We found that more males than females liked the technique, whereas the original study found the reverse. Also, our respondents said they wouldn't mind doing a crossword as a final official exam, whereas in the original study, students said they would hate doing it, even if it meant having a shorter test. But of course, both sets of respondents said they'd be interested in doing more crosswords for informal purposes, revision and so forth. Right. So let's have a think about the whole project and what you've learned from doing it. Well, it was very time-consuming. <laughs> yeah, and I don't think we managed that aspect very well. <laughs> it could have been worse. I mean, we didn't have a lot of data, so we didn't have to spend ages processing it. And of course, we'd already done a course on numerical data processing, so there wasn't much new there. Yeah, that's true. Anyway, I think we designed our questions well so that they gave us manageable data. Yeah, it really helped having the original study to guide us, as it were. And that helped us to see what a good research instrument is. What a good questionnaire should be like. Absolutely. We got a lot from that. But when we were writing up the project, I'm not sure whether we'll know how to acknowledge the work of the original study. You know, our referencing. No, that's something we'll both have to work on in the future. Actually, that part's been great. Finding ways to share and support another person. That's the real plus from the project. Learning ways to do that. Well, it's obviously been very successful. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a presentation by a student about a website she has designed for a supermarket. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40 on pages 113 and 114. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. For my website design project, I decided to approach Super Save Supermarkets because I have an evening job at the supermarket, so I already have a slight insight into their organisational goals and workings. 
The field research for my project was in two stages. First, I had an interview with Mr. Dunn, who is in charge of SuperSave's customer care department. I discussed the project with him in order to identify the supermarket's requirements. Mr. Dunn said customers are often unwilling to make a face to face complaint when they've experienced difficulties with a product or a member of staff or anything related to the supermarket. So he said a website which allowed members of the public to get in touch with the organisation and bring the problem to their attention in a private manner might be very useful. And we agreed that I'd work on this. For the second stage of my research, I devised a questionnaire to put to SuperSave customers. I needed to find out about the customers' experiences of problems together with their attitudes towards making complaints, both directly and indirectly. I used a mixture of closed questions, such as Have you ever experienced a problem at any SuperSave store? and open questions, such as What would you find helpful about a customer complaint website? I decided to do interviews rather than rely on distribution of the questionnaire, as I felt this was likely to lead to a higher take up rate. I visited four super safe stores, two in the city centre and two in the outskirts, and altogether I interviewed 101 respondents. Then finally, I analysed the results. I found the results of the questionnaires to be very informative. I found that out of the total number of customers investigated, 64% had at some stage encountered a problem in a super safe store. Out of these people, the vast majority said that they hadn't reported the problem to any member of staff, they just kept it to themselves. The next thing I tried to find out was why they hadn't complained. Well, about 25% of the people I interviewed said the reason was that they couldn't be bothered and a slightly smaller percentage said that they didn't have enough time. But 55% said the reason was that they felt intimidated. I finally asked if they would be more likely to complain if they didn't have to do it face to face and nearly everyone I asked said that they would, 95% to be exact. I then set about designing the website to meet these needs. Once I'd completed the website, I made another appointment with Mr. Dunn to find out what he thought of it. Mr. Dunn said he felt that the pages would benefit his organisation by giving customers a new way of expressing their complaints and by making it easier to collect complaints, identify specific places where service and customer care were not as good as they should be and act upon them accordingly. SuperSave is already a highly customer oriented organisation and he thought our website would be an excellent addition to their customer care effort. This is all well and good, but there still remains the general problem with websites that there's a lack of access to online computers. Surprisingly, in my survey, I found that 88% of those interviewed had access to the internet, which I felt was quite high. But this access wasn't always direct. For some people, it was through their children and grandchildren and neighbours and so on, rather than being readily available in their own homes. This could prove to be a major drawback to the site, but it is still better to have it now to get the edge over competitors, however slight, and in the very near future, it is expected that almost everyone will have direct access to the internet. Another thing to consider is that at the moment I can only base our conclusions on data gathered from a tiny fraction of the supermarket's customer base. In order to get a better idea of how the site is doing and to see how well I have met my objectives, the site will need to have been up and running for at least a few months. After this time, it'll be possible to see whether or not people are actually using the site and if it's helping to make improvements to their customer service. It would also be interesting to study the effect of the site on staff at the supermarket. Morale could be dented as more complaints come in. Staff may feel they are being unfairly criticised and that there is no need for another way for customers to complain.
but also the site could boost morale by making staff come together to overcome their constructive criticism, and they may gain more job satisfaction by knowing that they are making a difference to the customer. So, overall, I feel my website has met my objectives, but there is scope for improvement and expansion. Are there any questions? That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.